Ooh. Hope you are all as excited as we are to get started today. Please make sure to check the chat because in addition to all the introductions, we'll be sharing some links and resources with you throughout this session in that chat space. Um, I also wanted to make sure you all knew because this is in set up a Zoom webinar, you can add the live transcript or the closed caption yourselves at the bottom of the screen if that's something that would be helpful for you. Please feel free to turn those on. Um, we're going to get started with just sort of a quick fun poll to get a sense of how many of you might be attending your very first Healthy Teen Network event versus those of you who I'm used to seeing every fall and very much missing right now. So let us know, um, are you a Healthy Teen Conference first timer? Have you been two to four times over the year? Are you what I'll call a lifer and you come every year and have attended five or more times? Um, I'll give people just another minute. Looks like folks are still answering. Let's see. Oh, a few more people are still answering our poll. Is there popping in? And I'm going to close it right here. So it looks like, wow, we have about half of you that um, this is your very first conference, uh, about 34%, two to four times, and about 13% you've come um, five or more times. What great. Well, whether this is your first conference ever um, or your conference regular, we are so happy to have you here today and also to be part of the Healthy Teen Network community. Um, this is really an amazing network of youth serving professionals from all across the country who are committed to ensuring young people have what they need to live healthy sexual lives. Before we get into our opening session, I'd like to take just a moment to say a few thank yous. First, to our board, um, who has supported us every step of the way for this last year and then some. Um, they continue to bring their passion and commitment to young people. Thank you so much for sharing your time and energy with us. Then, of course, to the entire staff at Healthy Teen Network. If you know, you know, this is the most incredible, hardworking, creative, passionate group of people who truly make this job a joy, even after all these years, and especially during this past year. Thank you so much to the whole staff. I, we could not be here and pull this off without each and every one of you. You can learn more about our board and staff by going to the Our Story section, section on the Healthy Teen Network website. A few quick reminders about accessing the conference sessions. So you'll need to log into the conference hub, um, just like you did just now, to get the link for each of the sessions throughout these two days. And remember, the Join Now button won't appear until five minutes before the session. Make sure to refresh your page if you aren't seeing it pop up, because it will be there. So if you're not seeing it right away, just do a refresh, and it'll probably be there the next time. The hub is also where you can find slides and workshop materials, and then eventually we'll be posting most, all the sessions that we're able to record, we'll be posting them in that space. We'll be sending out an evaluation for all of the sessions at the end of the second day. We're not gonna do it after each session, we've just made one survey tool, and we'll push that out to all of you in the end of tomorrow. As always, we're truly interested in your thoughts and feedback. Um, we're also going to have a drawing for some great prizes, so make sure to fill out the conference evaluation tomorrow afternoon. We hope that you'll continue the discussion online and share your thoughts and comments on social media using hashtag HealthyTeen21 and tag us. We're at HealthyTeen on Twitter and at HealthyTeen Network on Instagram and Facebook. When planning for this year's event and knowing it would be virtual, once again, we reached out to our members and past conference participants to hear what you wanted, what would be most helpful at this moment in time. Thank you so much to those of you who took the time to share your thoughts with us. We designed this virtual event with that feedback in mind. So we shortened the overall length, we've scheduled shorter sessions, we varied our content. 
Our opening session tomorrow is in a podcast format to give our eyes a break. You can even take a walk, move around your house while you join the session. You can join from your laptop or you can join from your phone. We focused all our sessions on key information that can be applied now. For each session, we asked ourselves, what is relevant to me today and how can I take it home? We begin this afternoon with a thought-provoking opening session that will provide us with key information and considerations as we strive to be truly inclusive and effective when working with young people. And then just a little twist, we're gonna hold our questions for these speakers until tomorrow when they will join us to help close the conference. At that time, they will be sharing concrete steps and answering our questions. We hope that over these two days, you are able to find ways to stay engaged even though we're not all in the same room together. Some of you may have seen the blog post that we shared last week where we polled our staff about what tips and tricks we've learned over the last year for taking care of ourselves during virtual events. If you're able to, and I know it's so hard, we have so many things demanding our attention all the time, but I do hope you are, fine, you are able to find ways to protect, protect your time and take care of yourself while you're attending the conference. And now I am so pleased to introduce our opening session, Challenging and Expanding Your Understanding and Practice of Inclusivity with Tanya Bass, Stuart Getty, and Vanessa Giffard. We're excited to try something different with our opening session this year. We invited each of these individuals because they are experts in three areas that we know are essential for ensuring all young people have equitable access to the sex education and healthcare they deserve. Based on the feedback we heard, we worked with these presenters to record TED Talk style learnings and commentary to open our minds to these, to these three topics. As you will hear, each of our opening speakers encourages us to reflect on how we approach our work, to examine our biases and values, and to think about what we might want to change so, so we are able to create inclusive and affirming environments for all our young people. The first presentation is called Leveling Up, Providing Culturally Relevant Sexuality Education. Dr. Tanya Bass will share the value and importance of providing culturally relevant sex education across the lifespan. We live in an intersectional world and it's imperative for sex education and sexual health professionals to address the concepts of privilege, power and oppression and how they impact our sexual development and worldviews. Dr. Tanya Bass is an award-winning sexuality educator and mental health advocate that is committed to advancing health equity through culturally responsive and inclusive professional development. While maintaining an inclusive worldview, her work is shaped by her experience as a Black woman navigating systemic oppression. She has assisted in developing strategies to foster and facilitate the development of cultural and gender appropriate services in areas such as sexual health, including HIV and STI prevention, pleasure, adolescent sexual health, and reproductive health. In the second presentation, How Not to Be a White Savior in Sex Ed, Vanessa Giffard will talk about how to honor the identities of all our students while examining our values and dismantling the biases that uphold systems and inequality, oppression, and discrimination that keep our clients, students, and patients from getting the support they need. Vanessa Giffard is the founder of Vagisteam. Created in 2014, Vagisteam was founded as a platform of sex education for folks looking to understand and build up the esteem of and in their vulvas. In 2016, Vagisteam launched a podcast to encourage folks to engage in courageous conversations about sex, love, relationships, and everything in between. A child of Haitian immigrants, Vanessa is a life-affirming sex educator whose mission is to create a new generation of life-affirming sex educators which includes facilitating conversations about consent and boundaries, body confidence, healthy sexuality, teen pregnancy and abortion stigma, healthy relationships, and LGBTQIA inclusion. 
In the final presentation, How to They Them, Stuart Getty will share with us the importance of non-binary pronouns as a way to open up the world of gender freedom and expression beyond a binary that we made up in the first place. Just in time too, as half of Gen Z believes that the gender binary is outdated. Stuart Getty is a writer, filmmaker, and artist. By day, they work as a consultant at a global design company, IDEO, as a brand strategist, senior design lead, and workshop facilitator. Their main focuses are, are designing for inclusion, play, and branding with purpose. On the side, they write books, make films, and also do speaking engagements about gender, identity, and all things they. Tanya, Vanessa, and Stuart will join us again tomorrow afternoon to answer questions that arise from today's presentation. Make sure to jot your questions down as we'll be collecting them through an online form throughout today and tomorrow. We hope that these talks will open your hearts and minds and set the stage for the next two days of the conference. And now we'll hear from Dr. Tanya Bass, followed by Vanessa Giffard, and then Stuart Getty. Thanks for joining us on today. And today I'm gonna to be talking about leveling up, providing culturally relevant sexuality education. I am really excited to be with you today. My name is Dr. Tanya Bass, also known as the Southern Sexologist. I'm here in North Carolina. And one thing that I'm really passionate about is teaching sexuality education or helping prepare sexuality professionals as they are teaching their students and community members. And one of my main goals is to help provide that sexuality education in a more culturally responsive and sex positive way by providing professional development to sexuality professionals. So I want to start this talk out with a quote from Frederick Douglass. It is easier to build strong children than to repair broken, ad broken adults. And when I think about this quote, I really think about our responsibility as sexuality professionals and our responsibility to the youth and the young adults that we're teaching. So it makes me really reflect on how I wished I had someone like me when I was growing up. I think that for me, it certainly would have changed some of the decision making that I, you know, things that I chose to do when I was younger. And I also believe that wouldn't it be easier to just teach people what they need to know as they need to know it or even before they need to know it, then wait until we think they need to know it and then it's already too late and they've learned some hard lessons. So our responsibility as sexuality professional, professionals really needs to stem from helping people go through and get information that they need that's gonna help them along the way. So when I think about sexuality education, the implementation of what we do and how we show up as sexuality professionals is really influenced by many systems of oppression. Well, too often, we can think about sexuality education and the context of race, bias, social justice are often neglected topics that we don't often get to talk about or bring into the spaces when we're providing sexuality education. Most of, most of our sexuality education is really focused and narrow in its approach. It is not often culturally appropriate, culturally inclusive, sex positive, or um, really, I guess I should use the word intersectional for this moment. It's really not. And so as professionals, many of us have weren't even trained to provide this type of sexuality education. How many of you can say that you're able to embed these topics comfortably in your sexuality education? How many of you can actually say that you were prepared professionally to handle these conversations? I would say not. Now, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite sexuality educators is 
You are not teaching sexuality education comprehensively if you are not teaching it intersectionally. That's a quote from Justine Fonte. And that is such a great point. And honestly, a moment of truth for anyone providing sexuality education. Now, do you even know what intersectionality means? Do you even know what an intersectional approach to teaching sex ed, a decolonized approach to teaching sex ed? And when did you learn it? Who taught you how to do it? And do you even hold some of the multiple identities that don't even show up in the classroom sometimes when you're teaching? So an intersectional approach is super important for us to understand and to actually implement when we're teaching sexuality education. Now, here are the facts. Research has supported that these topics, or most of the topics that pose the most discomfort when teaching sexuality education include social justice, reproductive justice, racism, abortion, masturbation, pleasure, sexual identity topics, including um, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, and attraction. These are the topics that many of our peers and colleagues struggle with on a daily basis individually and personally, and it also shows up in their classroom. These are some of the most important topics that we need to talk about when we're teaching sex ed. And then these are some of the most intersectional topics related to who we are as human beings. We know that the social cultural context has a major influence on sexuality. So we should also be ensuring that these aspects are a part of the, sec or the professional development of sexuality educators. Research on comfort and capability of sexuality educators has supported that the topics that pose the most discomfort include social justice, reproductive justice, racism, abortion, masturbation, pleasure, sexual identity to include gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation and attraction. But these are some of the most important and intersectional topics critical for sexuality education for all people. Now we know that social cultural context has a major influence on sexuality. So we should ensure that these aspects, the things that we're most uncomfortable talking about are the things that we're including in our sexuality education, which also means these topics should be included in the professional development and professional preparation for sexuality educators. We also know that sexuality educators who actually teach from a social cultural understanding are more comfortable and more capable of actually providing socially just, sex positive, trauma informed, shame free, and inclusive sexuality education. So here's the deal. Sexuality education provided through this social cultural lens of understanding race, culture, socialization can really increase our ability to teach sexuality education while also dismantling several harmful stereotypes and issues around stigma. So what are we gonna do about it? Here's our opportunity. We have a great opportunity before us right now. We have an opportunity based on our positions that we hold as the provider of education for youth and young adults. We have to take that responsibility and make sure that we are sharing the positive societal implications around teaching these topics. We already know sexuality education can increase um, awareness on gender identity, various types of relationships, behaviors, and an understanding of human rights. We should actually take that privilege that we have teaching youth and young adults and ensure that we are addressing those topics and increase the knowledge and awareness on said topics. Now, I know you're sitting there wondering, well, how do I do this? Where do I begin? And I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad you're thinking it. I want you to know that I can provide you with a small, what I would call starter kit. Now, we already just acknowledged there's a lack of professional development with the social cultural context and understanding. And a lot of the sexuality education that we provide is really deficit-based and a prevention model of sexuality education. 
So some of this ha learning has to be done on our own. They are, there are so many books that we can actually read. So I'm providing you this starter kit of books that you can order, read online, rent, and even have discussions with your peers and colleagues about. When I think about some of the books that have greatly impacted the way I provide sexuality education, I think of Dorothy Roberts, Killing the Black Body, Skimmed by Andrea Freeman, Reproductive Justice by Loretta Ross, Medical Apartheid, Reprodu reproducing Race. Now that is a great ethnography that you should actually read. And one of the newer books um, I think about as far as having various worldviews and viewpoints and topics is the Handbook of Sexuality, which is edited by Dr. James Wadley. This is a book for sexuality professionals, whether you're a therapist, educator, or counselor, this is important. And many of us are talking about the impacts of critical race theory. I'd add that book to your resources and make sure you even understand what critical race theory is and what it means for sexuality education. And then finally, the next book that I'll highlight off of this slide is Intersectionality by Patricia Hill Collins. One of my favorite quotes from this book is how Patricia Hill Collins acknowledges we're working with young people and young people are some of the first people who experience oppression and marginalization and they really understand intersectionality regarding their age, their race and their gender right out the gate because of the way our systems are set up and how we navigate youth and young adulthood. Now I told you this is somewhat of a starter kit and maybe an expansion um, for some of the uh, others of you. What I'd like to say is that you want to go beyond reading a script or having a curriculum that you just follow the instructions and teach the way the script allows you to. You can also improve your self-efficacy if questions come up from your students about these topics. You can also be more comfortable and learn how to have that dialogue that I mentioned earlier with your peers and your colleagues. And no, it's not gonna be easy. And no, it's probably not gonna be pretty or even feel good, but it is so necessary. And it's worth the effort to ensure that you're providing the best sexuality education you can for the people you're serving. Now, this is not the only way you can learn. You can also take advantage of some of the professional development that's available. One that I recommend is a sexual attitude reassessment, better known as a SAR training. When I think about the SAR, there are many topics, including SAR trainings for working and teaching youth, SAR training specific to um, gender identity, SAR training related to intersectionality. And if you want, you can reach out to me and I can help you um, develop a SAR. I can also help provide a SAR for you and your agency and your team. SAR is one of the most effective ways to improve and increase your worldview. So there's so many things you can do um, in addition to the SAR and reading the book, but we'll start there. Any other professional development that you have on topics not specific to sex ed or sexuality education, you should take advantage of. Now, here's the last thing I will offer for you. I think that you should not only learn and reflect, but as you teach, learn. We have the new revised standards for the National Sexuality Education Standards. They've been revised and they include areas of when you could talk about some of these topics in the grade levels that are appropriate. Now it's important for you to learn those topics before you teach those topics. We also have available to us a pleasure-centered curriculum, a guide called SLAY, Sexually Liberated Affirmed Youth. Perhaps you're a funded agency and you're saying, well, I can only um, provide sexuality education through a certain curriculum. And that's okay. But you can learn and read through other curriculum and other lessons to learn how to better improve your implementation of those evidence-based interventions. Another cool thing that has just been released is a revision of the three R's curriculum. The three R's curriculum has two specific lessons that I've highlighted here. One is entitled, What's Racism Got to Do With It? The other is Reproductive Justice, Past, Present, and Future. 
these are lessons that you can use in between an evidence-based curriculum or add it to your classroom course of study overall. But most importantly, if you're someone who needs to increase your education, awareness, and comfort on talking about these topics, looking at these lessons and learning how to have these conversations will also make you a better professional as well. So that's all I really came to say today. I really hope that you will take the time to learn how to be a more socially just and inclusive sex positive sexuality educator. And remember, if you're, in, you're not teaching sexuality comprehensively, if you're not teaching it intersectionally, have a good day. Welcome to How to Not Be a White Savior in Sex Ed. So my name is Vanessa Giffard. I am a life-affirming sex educator, and we are ready to go on this journey together. So when we talk about what a white savior is, white savior essentially is a term that refers to a white person who provides help to non-white people in a self-serving manner. When we look at this concept, essentially there is a global systemic uh, issue that we're facing that's called the white savior industrial complex. And essentially this refers explicitly to the damaging effects of white saviors who prioritize a big emotional experience achieved through minor acts of charity or activism over tackling larger issues like systemic oppression and corruption that plague many nations around the world, and notably issues that are often directly caused or perpetuated by the United States. And then when we look at this at a more uh, local level, it's essentially Western people going into fixed problems of struggling nations or fix the problems of people of color without understanding their history, needs, or the region's current state of affairs. So typically when we think about this concept, we see it interna in international work and we see it on an international basis. And essentially when I thought about my experiences as a sex educator going into communities, I found that this concept was prevalent at a local level here in the United States. So here's why this matters. And this is why we're talking about it. And this is why I'm talking about it. Because white teachers make up the majority of teachers in the United States. More than any other time in the United States history, black students are being educated by people who are not of their racial or cultural background. And about 87% of the United States elementary and secondary teachers are white with only 8% of those teachers being black. So, I know a lot of you are asking yourselves like, oh my gosh, is this just for white folks? Well, we have to talk about this because yeah, white folks make up the overwhelming number of teachers in urban settings. And also, but when we look at this, black teachers with white supremacist ideologies are just as dangerous as white folks who don't understand culture. So essentially black folks can perpetuate a savior complex even though they can't be white saviors, if we are harboring anti-Black sentiments, if we are going to our classrooms with an anti-Black lens or trying to perpetuate these white supremacist ideologies, we too, as Black folks and folks of color, can, can actually cause damage and cause harm as well. So the effects of this, essentially, we are teaching from a place that is rooted in patronizing rather than seeing our students and the communities that we work in as partners. It leads to paternalism. So we're doing things to or for others rather than seeking to empower and build local capacity. We are essentially robbing the agency of the communities that we are in and the school communities that we are in. And essentially, it perpetuates this poverty porn um, mindset where we essentially are coming in as these saviors. We know best, we know everything, and we are coming in to save these communities. The other reason why this matters is because teachers who regard the impact of racism on Black children in particular, they do a lot of harm. And when we look at this more in the sex ed fields, many of the sex education efforts and also the curricula and also the makers of the curricula that a lot of us are paid to do essentially are designed for or by white people. 
And so essentially we, we, we do a lot of harm when we are not successfully making interventions and making sure that we're coming into communities um, with, the com with the community in mind and having them be a part of that process. And when we look at the larger impact, there's three things I wanna draw to our attention. Essentially the impact of this white savior complex of this anti-Blackness in our sex ed field is essentially how we show up with our language, how we show up in getting jobs and funding, and also how we see race as a risk factor. So let's talk about it. When it comes to language, essentially when we are in our classrooms and when we are teaching, essentially the impact of the white savior complex lead us to something called adultification of our young people, essentially where we see our youth as older than they are. So therefore there are more consequences. Therefore we might not be as sensitive when we're talking about these topics and these subjects. Essentially we erase the experiences and the rich culture and history of our students in our classrooms. Essentially we have whitewashed sex ed that does not honor the histories and the uniqueness of the students of color in our classrooms. Essentially, we're teaching inaccurate <laughs> sex ed. And when we look at our last point on my slide, we essentially weaponize sex ed. And so I wanna, I wanna delve a little bit deeper into this. And when I say weaponize, I want us to think about with the number two thing that shows up with funding. I'm gonna link these two. So essentially, a lot of us are in our classrooms teaching about the impacts of teen pregnancy. And we're talking, and a lot of us demonize teen pregnancy. But when we think about our students and we talk about our families and the family structures, essentially we are weaponizing many of the, the family structures that our students are coming from, right? So essentially if our students are teen parents themselves or they are raised by teen parents, or their grandmothers were teen parents. We are essentially dishonoring our students. And how can we expect to build relationships when our first interactions, and the whole reason why we're here is because we are dishonoring our students. Essentially with the funding cycles, a lot of us are teaching curricula that solely target teen pregnancy prevention or stigmatizing teen pregnancy, because essentially we had to write grants to grantors who wanted to see certain impacts on certain things that, again, weaponize and demonize our students. And then lastly, the way that this shows up is in our language and the stats that we use and how we, how we typically see our students as solely risk factors. And so the language that we use in our, in our time together with our students and the language that we use in getting funding for a lot of these programs, we say words like, these youth are high risk. We need to build culturally competent programs. We're going into inner cities to teach our young people. We're talking to underrepresented youth, right? And so there is this project that I have here on my slide that was created by the subversive thread that, got, that gets at a lot of these words that we use with our students or the words that we use in our funding projects, the words that we may use to describe the work that we're doing, we use things like underrepresented minority, under-resourced, inner city, underserved. And when we really think about this, underserved by who? Who is under-resourced? Why are they under-resourced? We, we fail to look at the systemic issues that, that fail essentially our young people and fail the schools that they're in, fail the communities that we're in. And then we essentially blame those communities and blame our students for the positions that they're in. And essentially when we look at the funding for this, a lot of grantors, a lot of um, the people that we are asking for money so that we can have these jobs to then go into the, these communities are essentially perpetuating a lot of these risk factors and looking at our students, not as individuals that have been failed by systems for years and centuries, but essentially as individuals who have failed themselves and essentially these, you know, underrepresented youth or underserved youth are in these, in these communities and in these positions and we need to swoop in and help them. And then lastly, to my last point with stats, 
when we're looking at the stats, and I and I talked about how we essentially see young people as stats versus the systems that create these issues, a lot of us are familiar with these stats on my slide, right? So we hear these stats around Black and Hispanic teen girls don't use contraceptive methods. Condom use has declined in Black and Hispanic high school students. Younger Black and Hispanic women are less likely to use hormonal birth control. And Black, Hispanic, Indigenous, and Pacific Islander populations have high prevalence of STIs, such as chlamydia, syphilis, and gonorrhea. Again, looking at people as health statistics, rather than looking at the systemic issues that impact why our young people don't have access to contraceptive care, how race and racism plays into clinic access and making sure that our young people are able to access these services without bias, without shame, and without providers essentially looking at them uh, <laughs> negatively for essentially advocating for their sexual and reproductive health. So I'm going to end with uh, this tweet that I saw earlier this summer, and it says, let's have a motion to replace underrepresented with historically excluded. Position matters. The former is a consequence of the latter. Let's not forget. Thanks so much. And I hope you learned a little bit about how our white saviorism or our anti-Blackness shows up in our sex ed. My name is Stuart Getty, and I'm here to talk about a lot of things. One of the things is based around a book that I've written, which is called How To They Them, A Visual Guide to Non-Binary Pronouns in the World of Gender Fluidity. And I like to show my cover right off the bat because on the back, the four blurbs of those authors and those um, distinguished folks, those are kind of heroes. And so I like to show this to start off to be like, dreams are possible, see, see everyone. Um, and then I like to show this photo, which, which is um, on the right is my year 2000 senior picture. So when I was in high school, so when I was a teen, um, and I was in classes and in support of folks like y'all. Um, this is what I looked like. And I like to share that because high school is funny <laughs> and we're going through like lots of growth and development and we are finding ourselves. And so as someone who gets to witness that and be around for that, I think it's really important to create safe containers and safe spaces or braver spaces and safer spaces for kids to explore who they are and find themselves, um, you know, safely. Uh, so my talk is all about why is it important to learn about gender fluidity and non-binary pronouns? Well, I sort of counter that question with another question of like, is it important to make students feel welcome? Because you're learning about a certain sect of your, your, your students or the kids that you are in contact with. Um, and if you look at the research that keeps coming out about Gen Z, um, which I believe they started in 1986, um, or 1996, excuse me, um, there is research that shows that one in every five Gen Z individual identifies as not straight, and one in 10 identifies as non-binary. So when you think about your classrooms or the spaces that you're creating for these students, why wouldn't you want to learn more about all of these kids that are going to be in your presence and in your tutelage? <laughs> um, and so that's why I'm here is to create sort of a shame-free space uh, without judgment to walk you through a little bit about my book. And I wrote this book with sort of a couple of design principles. One was make it visual, make it so that lots of people could understand it, which I'm giving you these design principles because I feel like when you're trying to create resources for your classrooms and for your communities, potentially this is stuff that you might want to keep in mind as well. Um, so I wanted to really make it visual. I wanted to put diagrams. I wanted to make um, I wanted to bring it to life. And I also wanted to make it funny, um, not just because I'm kind of a smart ass, but because I think that when we use comedy, it is this on ramp for a sense of belonging. And that's like my, I guess my third design principle is creating with a desire to foster a sense of belonging. And I feel like this book broke a lot of binaries with my editor while I was making it because I did try very hard to create a sense of belonging for um, for everyone to feel invited into this conversation. I know that so much right now when we have tough conversations, um, a lot of people feel like hand slap and they feel like I, I'm doing it wrong. And, um, and it just gets like tense and they retract and they're so terrified to do it wrong that they stop trying because they're so scared. And so I feel like 
comedy and belonging and visuals um, create more relaxation to take in the information. So without further ado, I'm gonna walk you through some of my book because I wanna just lay the foundation for you, the, the bedrock for what this can look like and learning about non-binary pronouns in the world of gender fluidity through the eyes of Stuart Getty who wrote a book about it. So they 101, um, I start the book with something that tells you a little bit about my tone. So I'm gonna read you this page. This is the first couple pages of my book. They are good. Gently place your tongue against the inside of your front two teeth. Now blow until a whistling sound lightly emerges. They it, don't spray it. Now open the mouth to say A, as in the letter A, or the sound Canadians make at the end of sentences, kind of. Or like a friend is driving by in a car and you wanna get their attention. A. Now try it together. A. It's literally that easy for your mouth. But for your brain, well, that's a little harder, but don't worry, I got you. So I'm just sharing that as like an introduction to the kind of tone of voice that I use when I'm talking about this tough subject. Um, already I can see people, I don't, I can't really see this is recording, but I can see, I can imagine that your shoulders are starting to relax and you're starting to maybe feel a little bit more welcomed into the space simply by having a little fun. So I encourage you to do the same. So I also, I start the book with the story of Stuart um, and a lot of rollerbladed re references because when I was writing the book, I was really, really getting into <laughs> rollerblading. But I'm bringing this up because I tell the story of myself to help others see themselves. And I think that as teachers and as educators and as people who create community for kids, and when I speak to kids and when I you know, have done speaking engagements, I just find that kids are themselves so hungry to hear from us about something that they can relate to, about a journey that we've been on, about the ways that we have found ourselves. Even if your identity doesn't match with their identity, just showing how you too went through this journey. Um, I find that it really levels, it brings you down to the same level with your students, with your community. Um, and I think that it just really, really helps. So I'm gonna read you another page from my book. So hi, I'm Stuart. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, Catherine Stuart Getty. Kentucky is known for horses, good bourbon, and fried chicken. Not gay stuff, <laughs> but boy was I gay. It was in me all along, the feeling of being not quite female, not quite male, not quite like the other girls. So growing up in Kentucky, I was a tomboy, a weird little kid, think bowl cut, buck teeth, skin knees. Tomboy was this okay category for girls who like to do boy things and wear boy clothes. Maybe there was a touch of shame and guilt to it to not be what a female should be. Being a tomboy was second tier almost, like a girl, but not the best kind of girl. So I share about tomboy as maybe my first experience with gender expression because by being labeled a tomboy, I was able to be outside of the binary of the girls. And like at recess, I would go and play um, dodgeball with the boys and get picked like one for, one of the first people because I was very good and sporty. Like I said, I'm a jock. Um, and yeah, and the, the girls were always playing Foursquare, which later in life I was Foursquare, I got, <laughs> I got into. However, at that time there was just this, um, you know, this divided boy versus girl thing. And I was able to transcend that from an early age just by being a tomboy. So I like to share that just to be like, wow, like it's a whole journey. And speaking more of my journey, like, like to tell about like going to a camp in Kentucky, Camp Piamingo, love Camp Piamingo, where I first saw like armpit hair, happy trails, tie dye and Birkenstocks. And like thinking back on that now, I'm like not wearing Birkenstocks or tie dye right now, but most of my life I'm wearing Birkenstocks and tie dye. So I think of it as such a like pivotal and life-changing moment for me to see elders and they weren't that much older than me. So I could really relate to them, but they were living their truth and they were living their freedom. And I'm bringing that up again because I think that that can go a really long way when you are fostering, you know, blossoming children. Um, something else that I think is really important is weird. Um, I bring up the word weird a lot in my book as well about like, it feels weird to use this pronoun, they, for the first time when I was asking for it and for folks that were for the first time saying it for me. But I like to say that weird is one of my favorite words. And I loved being called a weirdo when I was a little kid. <laughs> and so maybe it feels weird, but weird is good. Weird means that growth is happening. And weird is what pushes us to our edges so that we can stretch and grow and be more. So when you think that something is weird or it's like uncomfortable, you might actually just be growing and you might be finding a new way of doing things. And so I like to bring that up because I think, I'm gonna assume here, but like for so many of you folks out there, potentially this feels a little funny and it feels a little weird. And like, I bring this up in my book, it's like you have neural pathways that have taught you that they is a plural pronoun. And then you have this whole section of people that are saying, actually, the way that we were using it 
in this world when we didn't know someone's gender, we were using it as a singular pronoun anyway, and it feels really right. And there were other pronouns that didn't work. So let's do this they thing. And I just wanna like say weird out loud and say, it's okay to feel weird. It's okay to be rebuilding brain pathways. It's okay, but it's also part of growing and part of becoming more than what you are right now. And I believe in that. I believe in that growth and that, that changing for the better. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the basics of they aka gender identity and expression, because I just want to start with the building blocks so that all of you out there are like, got it. I'm at least a little bit more informed after this chit chat. So we called this in the book, the big three, and these are like the basics. And if you can understand these three, then you basically start understanding more of this whole sphere that we're talking about of gender identity, gender expression, et cetera. But it starts with sex assigned at birth. S-A-A-B, not to be confused with sobs, cool cars, especially the convertible, I always wanted that when I was little, but sex assigned at birth, which is what it says, but I'll go into each of these, I think. Gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, so these are the three that I think that if you get these, then you got this, right? So we'll start with sex assigned at birth. So when you are born, they look at your physical body and then they say, it's a girl, it's a boy. And then I added, congrats, it's a day. But, and what we used to think that that meant was like male over here, female over here. And we had very like strict lines for these anatomy, these hormones, these chromosomes. But as like science has evolved, we've realized that there's so much more to it and that sex can actually look externally a bunch of ways. It can have different internal anatomy. It's hormones can be different. Your chromones could be all sorts of stuff. Um, and so it really just starts opening your eyes that like, Yes, this they thing and gender fluidity is a thing, but also look at like how different the world is. Like look at how different identities exist out there. And if we went just by sex assigned at birth, which is like, hey, eh, eh, like that's the, the crying baby, like, oh, put a pink hat on it, okay. Um, then we would be missing out on like all of these different ways that people show up in the world. So I like to bring that up. Um, and I actually learned a ton during this writing this book about sex chromosomes and how there's all these people with different types of chromosomes, like the Kleinfelter syndrome and Turner syndrome. Um, and they, they show up differently and they might be classified as intersex, which is sort of between or beyond um, male or female, even when you're born. So they might, you might be like, hey, congrats, it is a day. Um, and I think why I bring this up is like our hormones and our chromosomes, which we thought were such a strict line are really actually different. And when we start to opening these definitions, we start being open to so many different types of people, not just those that use they, but people that might have other stuff going on. Um, and so I really like to just start there. And then the other two big ones are, um, you know, gender identity, which essentially is like, what do you identify as with gender? And it can be different than the way that you were, you were born which is trans, or it can be the same as, which is cis, which I bet some of you guys have heard that before, like cis and trans. And trans means oh, um, on the opposite side from, I think, um, in some language, Latin, I believe, and cis means on the same side. And so it just means that you're cis, you're on the same side of what your sex assigned at birth matches your gender identity. And then the third one is your sexuality or your sexual orientation. And your sexual orientation just means who gets your engine Grooming, right? Who makes you feel that tingle inside? And I think you guys all know what that really means. Um, and so then I go into in my book, like other stuff that comes up a ton about like, um, you know, what happens if I mess up? What do I do if I mess up? That is like one of the number one things that I'm always asked. Yes, I want to do the right thing, but it's hard and my brain is wired this one way, and this person just asked for a new name or they started asking for a new pronoun, and I just I just mess up. And so everyone messes up. <laughs> I wanna start there. And I wanna also say, say that like queers mess up. And when we're in our circles and we have the same things going on of folks changing names and changing pronouns, like we also mess up. But the thing that we do in queer circles, and this is what I'm offering to you, is you fix it very, very quickly and you move on. And then you start, you let life keep living. You let the conversation keep flowing. And I think that's a really important thing to remember because I've had it happen at work where someone will be like, oh, she's going to get the da 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 da. Oh my God, Stuart. Oh my God. I know that you're not a she. Oh my God. I know that you use they. I am the worst person. Oh my God. How could I do this? And we're having a conversation, but 
we've stopped having the conversation and now what it's all about is your guilt and shame. And so I just want to like note that because I know that that feeling is that what you feel inside of you by being like, oh, oh, is like, I'm being there for this person to show them that I see them. But like, if you quick, quickly fix it, like Stuart, she, excuse me, they are going over there to rollerblade or whatever, like so quickly that we've just barely missed a beat and we're continuing the conversation. And then it's not about your guilt or shame, no offense, but it's really just about, let's try to see each other the way that we're asking to be seen. So fix it, move on, let life keep living. You can do it. I have some other tips in the book too, which I like to share when I share about this book. Um, gender reveal parties. They don't actually tell you the gender of a kid because at the time of birth, what you know about your kid, if you are being inclusive, is a junk or anatomy announcement. So on this page is a peen cake. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to fight very hard to keep this pean cake in. So I like to show it as often as possible to be like, ha ha, pean cake, fly free. But I think it's a really easy way to illustrate that what we know is not what we think we know. And that gender may come along a little bit different. So you'll see at the bottom, it says, my child has a penis, their gender is TBD. Check back in a few years, enjoy the cake and our grayscale color scheme. Get it? Because you wouldn't do blue or pink, which I'm just noticing I'm wearing blue and pink and like, I didn't even do that on purpose. Um, and so I also like to share this, which is like a question of like, who can use they? And then that's a trick question because anyone can. And these are all sorts of different ways to show up externally expressing yourself, but internally you may still feel like you wanna use they or be genderqueer or gender fluid or gender creative or gender expansive or whatever word that the folks wanna use. People who look, who wanna use they can look all sorts of different ways. So don't judge a book by its cover. I think that teachers used to say that all the time, you know, as like, hints as tips. And I, I encourage that, especially when we're talking about gender identity. Um, some other like do's and don'ts, do ask pronouns, but don't call them preferred pronouns. We did for a minute call them preferred pronouns, but we as a whole world and a society, um, we've stopped doing that. Sure, we prefer that you call us by our pronouns, but it's not like we prefer a gender, we just are one. So they're not preferred pronouns, but it is great to ask for them. Also do put pronouns on name tags and email signatures. Don't avoid pronoun talk in places where gender queer people are absent. If it feels safe to talk about pronouns and gender when a GNC, that's not the health store, but gender non-conforming or non-binary person, non-binary means not falling into the binary of male to female. When someone who, is, who isn't in the room, who identifies as such, think of how safe they'll feel when they are in the room. If you're able to have those conversations when we aren't there, um, one of the things that came out of this book that I heard so much is folks that are genderqueer and present that way. Um, people won't be asking pronouns, but that person <laughs> will walk in and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, pronoun time. And that is also just like a big alarm of like not belonging, not feeling belonging. So don't do that. Um, I, I bring up all of this because people are so different. There are all sorts of different ways that people show up. And I really like to express that like, these parts are all valid and there is no normal. Like we were taught that we had to we try to be normal, you know, a female or a male to be normal. But when we allow for this wider diversity of humans and life experience, it lets people define for themselves what that normal means. So I think that it, like, it definitely applies to folks that are genderqueer and use a weird pronoun, but it's also like being intersex, being redhead, being with different abilities and needs. Like all of these things are not things that need to be fixed or indicators that something is wrong. These are parts of a valid and beautiful human experience and they deserve love and acceptance in the world. And maybe this sounds all cliche and idealist, but this is the world that I'm hoping to create. And I think all of you guys are listening along because you do too. Um, something that I also get asked a ton is, yeah, actually it's mostly my mom <laughs> saying, but it's not grammatically correct, but it's not grammatically correct. And I know that you guys are educators and teachers and you guys have learned grammar rules. And so there's a part of you that doesn't wanna let go of that. However, stop, grammar time. Um, everyone asks me about this. And so I'm, I show this chart to show you how your brain has been set up of like first person, singular I, plural we, second person, you, you all, third person, he, she, it, they. So you're like, yes. And that chart is just like muscle memory into your everyday speech. You're at the grocery store and you're conjugating without feet without thinking. And as part of that conjugation, you're making a split second decision about what someone's gendered identity is. Did you think about that? Like you're looking at someone and being like, I'm clocking you as a pink or blue. Um, so 
I like to interrogate that. Like, what, what assumptions are you making? How do you know? How can you tell? As I've said earlier, like, people can look so many different kinds of ways. So when you first start using they as a singular pronoun for someone, you might always have to be thinking a little bit or trying a little, and that's okay. It just takes practice, but don't worry. You got this. So then on this next page, because I was really into rollerblading, I told you, I conjugate for rollerblading. So it's first person, I rollerblade, we rollerblade. Second person, you rollerblade, you all rollerblade. And then third person, like Doc shreds, he rollerblades. Hillary shreds, she rollerblades. Stuart is a shredder. They rollerblade. It is a fun time. Stuart and their wife skate together. They rollerblade. She actually doesn't use rollerblades. She uses quads. Um, but this is this is the chart that you need to start putting to memory. This is you can use a verb of your choice. You don't have to use shredding, although eh, very fun. Um, you'll notice that I'm conjugating the singular they like the plural they, and I do that because I don't want to throw so many things off when you're speaking that you have to change so many things. Some folks that are genderqueer conjugate it differently. I am recommending to try this way because I think it's easier on the brain and I think that it's most widely accepted. Um, I, my family likes to say like they is, they is coming. And I don't really correct them because I know that they're trying and God bless them. I'm from Kentucky, God bless them. So also in the book, um, there are some tips for parents of kids who use they, them. And I think that this is important to go over because you might be getting questions from parents or you might be a parent yourself of, of, of a kid who is finding their way in this way. So the first thing I like to say is that if they are telling you that they have these feelings, well then congrats to you. And if they're telling you as a teacher, congrats to you as well, because that means that they feel safe around you. And that means that you're holding an identity as a beautiful and valid thing. And to me, that's the future. So just take a moment to recognize that for yourself and just really honor that that you're killing it and then some other things to to do and to think about are like be patient this <laughs> this might change from time to time they might go on a journey i have a friend who's six-year-old um used they for a year and now is he and using the boys bathrooms and i think that's part of this journey is holding it all open and holding it all with acceptance um, another thing is listen and ask questions, stay curious, really try to hear your, ch your child. V vulnerability is really powerful. So be brave and tell your ch child that they are brave when they're sharing with you so they can feel that courage and believe them. Um, I think this is hard for parents and teachers sometimes because they're like, how does that five-year-old know if they're they? How do they know if they want to be an astronaut or a dinosaur, right? So believe them and hold them with a lot of acceptance and treat them like they know for themselves who they are. Um, because that's how you get them to show up in the world in that way, knowing who they are. Uh, some other things to think about, give gender-free gifts. If family members can't hack it with the they or the changing of a pronoun, well, don't do public gift openings because it can be crushing for a kid to open a card that says to my grandson, well, that's not when that's not how they feel about their body. Um, it's also just being mindful of like public moments that might be gender related. Um, if you wanna be setting up that container for them, you might wanna just be a little bit more careful and intentional about how you do that. Talk the talk, have the awkward conversations, ask them, always check in with your kids or with your students about what they want other people to know and thank them. It's brave to share this. It's a lot of you know gratitude for them to let you know them in this way. So thank them. And that gratitude can open doors to more shares. And here we are, we're getting to basically the end of my book and what I like to call my thesis statement, because this is more than just pronouns and grammar lessons and arguments about bathrooms. This is about freedom of expression and the human right to choose for oneself how to identify oneself. And while they might be for some of us, the freedom is for everyone, everyone, all of you. So let's grab it. Let's do this. And the literal, literal, literal last, last page of my book is for the trans kids and the trans folks out there and the non-binary people and the folks that are challenging the binaries and doing something that goes against what the norms of our society are. And I like to say, you are not alone and we are sacred. And I like to close with that. So that's it. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you so much. 
to Tanya, Vanessa, and Stuart for kicking off this year's conference. You've already given us so much um, to think about. And I know many of you have questions and you wanna hear more about what to do with this information, um, but we wanted to give you time and space to reflect on and to consider what you've just heard and to really think about it over the next two days in your other sessions. And we felt that questions might bubble up during that time as well. So if it seems like we're leaving you on a bit of a cliffhanger, well, we are. Um, but don't worry, we come back to Tanya, Vanessa, and Stuart tomorrow afternoon. They'll be answering your questions as well as sharing practical things that we can start doing right away. Um, the other thing that I wanted to let you know is we've already posted the slide of the book recommendations up on the hub, and we will be posting all of the other slides along with the video from today um, by tomorrow afternoon. The slides might be up today, the video up tomorrow. Um, you can continue to find the link to submit your questions also on the, hub, the conference hub as well, right under the session description. Up next, we have a 15 minute break. Um, we'll start back actually now 12 minute break. We're gonna start at 2.15 East Coast time. Um, please take care of yourselves, stretch, relax. If you're able to, I highly encourage that you don't check your email or other messages. Take the time to move around, pick out your afternoon workshop and we'll see everyone together um, at the end of the day to close our session with Andrea Holyfield, who will walk us through her five-step process for executing the desired change we want to see in our careers. Thank you all so much, and we will see you then.